During the ancient period, humans all over the world worshipped different gods. These are generally regarded as polytheistic societies, but there is often a presence of one creator god, or god above all others. In this video, we will take a look at the different deities from the major ancient cultures. Our journey begins in Africa. Here, the mountains, hills, valleys, rivers, and bushes were thought to possess divine intelligence. This was manifested through spiritual beings the Egyptians and Nubians would call Netaru. Later West African societies, like the Yoruba, would call these Orishas. These beings controlled the universe, so needed to be worshipped, and sometimes feared. Their worldly intermediaries were priests who wore protective amulets. In ancient Egypt and Nubia, they were called Kerheb, or Lector priests. In West Africa, the Yoruba would have a similar priest called the Babalawo. In South Africa, the Zulu would have a Sangoma. It was thought in some regions of ancient Africa, that the dead could return to life, so they would often have limbs or heads removed to prevent this. In Northeastern Africa, the most prominent regions were Egypt and Nubia, but the land of Punt, most likely in present-day Somalia, and Ethiopia, were also thriving societies. Though we know Ethiopia became a bastion for Christianity early on, they practiced different rituals and worshipped different gods prior. Awi, the supreme deity, had a human mother, but his father was a zendo, or snake. Worship of Awi was done through sacrifice, both human and animal, along with offerings, like cows, milk, and goats and seems to be a god associated with pastoralism. Once agriculture and crop farming became more prevalent, a fertility goddess, a teat, or a tete, became more widely worshipped in the southwest of the country, mainly by the Oromo people, a Cushitic ethnic group. A teat was thought to hold the power to cause great misfortune, like famine, disease, and even death. To appease her, offerings needed to be made annually. Once Christianity entered Ethiopia much later, Atit was still regarded as an intermediary between this world and the Christian God. Atit could be invoked for different reasons and activities. Atit Hara is associated with the water and is calming, while Atit Dwala is associated with war. Atit celebrations were held in the late summer, during the Ethiopian New Year. For the ceremony, a woman would take ground barley and place it over grass. The woman then moved special beads over her face while asking Atit for good fortune. Nearby, Nubia would be ruled from Kerma, Napta, and Merui, during different periods from the Bronze Age into the Classical Era. Many of the Nubian gods were the same as the Egyptian deities. Some might have even originated here in Nubia, as they were always linked with the powers of Upper Egypt. Near the end of our time frame, the Nubians regained independence from Egypt, and founded the Kingdom of Kush around 1070 BCE. Their capital was set up at Napta, near the sacred Jebel Barkal mountain, that had also been previously occupied by the Egyptians. We like to give African gods human appearances or even visual depictions, but many of the gods of ancient Africa were formless, and their spirits were associated more with rituals, costumes, temples, and the natural world. In Egypt, the gods were called Netja. They were represented by this hieroglyph. It looks like a flag, but is a staff with a cloth attached. There is no concept of religion as we have now, but their term for something sacred was Desher. Midu Netja denotes the writings of the gods, and its literal meaning is the word of God. Ancient Egyptian pictographs are how the Egyptians preserved their oral stories and traditions. It was through this ancient writing system that these gods truly became immortal, as they were always meant to be. A constant theme was the conflict between chaos or isfet, and order, or mart. But with Egypt's long history, it's no surprise that the religion still evolved. The very oldest of the gods were created through bodily fluids, like spitting or masturbation, but the later gods were born more traditionally, with parents. Egyptians worshipped over 1400 different gods and goddesses, based on different cities or regions. At Memphis in Lower Egypt, Ptah, Sekhmet, and Nefertum formed the triad of gods. 
In Thebes, the triad was Amun, Mut, and their son, Khonsu. At Abydos, it was Osiris, Isis, and Horus. These triads were portrayed as families, with two adults and their next of kin. Egyptian cosmology tells of the birth of the cosmos, by a tomb. A tomb the creator, comes into existence either by calling his own name, or born from a blue lotus flower or egg. He then spits into existence Shu and Tefnut, primordial gods who would become the ancestors of the gods. Shu and Tefnut then produce Geb, the earth, and Nut, the sky. Geb and Nut then produce Osiris, Isis, Seth, and Nephtis. These were the original nine gods of Egypt, known as the Ennead of Heliopolis. A less common myth, comes from Hermopolis, and tells of the Ogduad, or eight original gods, who gave rise to all living things. Religious life in Egypt was a daily occurrence. State religion was run by the government, who conducted daily and annual rituals and festivals. The main job of the king and his entourage was to take care of the major temple, housing a holy statue. The king or high priest would enter the sacred room of the temple, and take care of it. They did this to keep the gods present in the temple and city, to maintain mart, or order. By doing this, the king and high priests were seen as intermediaries between the gods and the public, and seen as servants themselves. Most gods in the pantheon were initially worshipped locally, but many became popular in different regions until they became widespread. Ptah, as stated earlier, came from Memphis, Amun Ra from Thebes, and a mix of Ra and Horus, Ra Horicti, from Heliopolis, but they became worshipped everywhere. Other gods were just worshipped at the local temples, but because of this it's likely many gods declined or became mixed and merged with other deities, and never reached us. Though Atum was the creator god, he was too distant to be involved in everyday life, and Amun, another deity, became the most popular. He was one of the deities in the Ogduad, the eight primordial gods of Hermopolis, and was known as, the Hidden One. He was depicted wearing a crown of two vertical plumes. In statues, they used the Cryosphinx, a sphinx with the head of a ram. During the New Kingdom period, Amun was fused with Ra, to create Amun-Ra, the transcendental self-created supreme deity. Along with Osiris, he is the most widely recorded Egyptian god. The Osiris myth itself, is one of the most famous. He is killed by his jealous brother, the god Seth, and his body parts scattered across the earth. Osiris became the judge and ruler of the underworld. It's possible he developed from a more local god named Anjeti, who could have originated from a benevolent shepherd who became revered. Both Anjeti and Osiris hold the crook and flail, items associated with shepherds. The cult of Osiris was at Abydos. His sister, and wife, was Isis, a goddess who partially revives Osiris, and conceives his son. She was part of the gods of the Ennead, worshipped in Heliopolis. Their son was called Horus, who became the god of kingship and the sky. He is also a member of the Ennead, and represents order, or Mart. Seth, the murderous brother to Osiris, represents Isfet, or chaos. He is also a member of the Ennead, and is often represented as the set animal, an unidentifiable beast, which could be a wild dog, aardvark, or jackal. Thoth, was worshipped at Hermopolis, and is often depicted with the head of an ibis. He is the god of the moon and writing, and is seen writing the results of the weighing of the heart in the judgment scene from the Book of the Dead. Despite all the gods Egypt possessed, one pharaoh almost made them all obsolete. During the 18th dynasty, during the New Kingdom period, Pharaoh Amenhotep IV, lifted the sun disk, or Aten, as the one supreme god, introducing a type of monotheism. He took the name Akhenaten, and made the city of Amarna as the cult center. This was also meant to reduce the power of the growing priests of Amun who were amassing too much wealth and influence. The shake-up didn't last long though, and once the next Pharaoh, his son Tutankhamun, took power, the old gods were restored, and Akhenaten's vision was over. Nearby, in the Levant, were the Protosemitic states. 
During the early 20th century, a stunning discovery was made at Ugarit, a Canaanite city on the northern Syrian coast. Excavation produced thousands of cuneiform tablets, written in a language called Ugaritic. It is an extinct Semitic alphabet, but was used from around 1500 to 1300 BCE. The tablets that were found, called the Ugaritic texts, dated from around the 12th or 13th centuries BCE. They total over 1,500 texts and fragments describing rituals, correspondence, and legal and administrative texts. The most famous, though, are short stories about Canaanite mythology. Some of these epic poems are The Baal Cycle, The Legend of Keret, and The Tale of Akhat. Using these texts, scholars were able to learn more about the pantheon of the Semitic peoples of the Levant, like the Canaanites. El, the Semitic word for God, was their supreme deity. He is generally depicted as a kind and loving father figure, but also appears once as a drunkard. El was the father of many gods, including Baal. Baal was seen as a younger version of El. In fact, instead of God, his name means Lord. He is sometimes depicted as a storm god, and in the Baal cycle, battles both Yam, the god of the seas, and Mart, the god of death. A temple to Baal has been unearthed at Ugarit, and was worshipped by the Canaanites. The name has often been associated with evil, as Baal was presented in the Old Testament as a false god. Dagon, or Dagan, was a god associated with fertility. We have no texts about his myths or stories, but we know he was worshipped in Ugarit, as well as other northwest Semitic cities. He was also mentioned in the Old Testament, in the book of Samuel, as a god of the Philistines, a people who would come to live in this region during the coming Iron Age. El, as ruler of the gods, had a consort. This was Asherah, a fertility goddess who appears in the Semitic pantheon throughout the Near East. The Ugaritic texts also speak of Anat. She was a warrior goddess of warfare and hunting. She could have been derived from a prior goddess called Hanat, worshipped by the Amorites in Upper Mesopotamia. In the myths, she helps her brother Baal in the battle against Mart, the death god. It's possible the later Greek goddess Athena was based on Anat. Kothar was the divine artisan. He is depicted as a musician, magician, architect, and blacksmith. In the myths, he supplies Baal with the weapons to fight Yam, god of the sea. Continuing around the Mediterranean, we get to Europe's first known civilization, the Minoans. At the settlement of Fornu Corifi, dating from the early Minoan period, was found what is the oldest Minoan representation of a goddess. This is the goddess of Myrtos, and was found in what is thought to be a shrine. She is seen holding a water jug, but what is most striking are her strange shaped features. Her neck is elongated, and her head tiny in comparison to her body. These proportions might seem like simple mistakes, but the Minoans had represented humans more accurately in earlier works. Scholars surmise that this figurine's proportions are no mistake, and that they are meant to represent something greater than human, like a goddess. The figurine also shows no signs of being used frequently or manhandled, like with non-religious figurines or other objects. During the next period, the Middle Minoan, more figurines were created which possibly represent Minoan goddesses. From Phaistos, an image on an offering table could represent another goddess. The same kind of scene was found on a bowl. At Knossos, the Minoan capital, we find the more famous Minoan snake goddesses. Some of their gods were associated with other elements of nature, from trees and flowers, to birds. Ancient Minoans also found their man-made objects to be divine. The labris, a double-headed axe, could have been used as a sacrificial weapon, but what is more certain is that it was a religious item. Labrises were produced out of gold, silver, and other metals. The palace at Knossos had winding pathways and confusing architecture, and was known for its representations of labris, making it known as the Palace of the Double Axe, or as we would call it in modern times, Labyrinth. Labrises were built in the shrines here and depicted on frescoes. Another sacred object, 
were the horns of consecration. Their shape represents the horns of the bull. Some claim they could represent the Egyptian symbol of a valley through two mountains. They began by being built small, usually on vases, but by the late Minoan, they would be built from stone, in monumental fashion. These were at the Palace of Knossos and Mount Jupiter's. Medium-sized horns appeared from the palaces in the central and eastern regions of Crete. The last sacred item we will discuss, is the Batil. The Batil is like a cult stone that depicts a deity, and is considered sacred. The word is Semitic and means, House of God. Several images appear, of Minoans embracing Batils, with nearby butterflies, perhaps representing deities. They could be associated with a tree cult. Minoans seem to have worshipped more female deities than male, but there are still representations of their male gods. One of the few comes from Karnia. It is a master impression, depicting a nude male, wearing only shoes, a belt, and a necklace. He stands tall, above a shrine or series of shrines, holding a staff. If we look closer at the shrines, we notice many of them are topped off with the horns of consecration. The sand and water at the base, tells us this to be a city on the shores. The size of the man with the staff, along with his position between horns of consecration, can possibly identify him as a deity, a patron god of this city. Another important piece of iconography, was found at Palicastro. This was a chryselephantine statue, meaning it was made with gold and ivory. It was called the Palicastro Kouros, and depicted a Kouros, or male youth, in a worship pose. But the size of the statuette, at around 50 centimeters tall, and the materials used to create it, like the gold, ivory, and hippopotamus tooth, suggest this could be a deity. These precious materials needed to be imported, most likely from Egypt, and the expert detail and craftsmanship suggests this can be the cult image of a Minoan god. Scholars can gather a lot of information about Minoan gods through the Mycenaean script, the Indo-Europeans who lived on mainland Greece and later invaded Minoan Crete. This information was found on Linear B tablets, which came from cities both on the mainland, like Mycenae and Thebes, and those on Crete, like Knossos. Some deities' names like Zeus or Poseidon appear both on mainland and Cretan tablets, other names appear only on the mainland, but some appear only on Crete. These could be associated with Minoan deities. One of the many names, Atana Potnia, could have been an early version of who would become the Greek goddess Athena. Eunalios could have become the Greek god Ares, and Piawon might have become Apollo. Although their names weren't found on the mainland, they were probably adopted or merged with Mycenaean gods. These Mycenaean gods were written about in the Linear B texts. These gods might have originated with the Indo-European peoples who migrated into Greece, or could have belonged to those on the mainland who lived there before the Greek speakers arrived and adopted the deities. Scholars are fairly certain some gods, like Zeus and Poseidon, are Indo-European in origin, but others are unclear. Some of the Mycenaean gods we find in the texts, like Hermes and Hera, continue into the ancient Greek pantheon of the classical era, while many disappear after the Bronze Age collapse. Mycenaean iconography is similar to the Minoan, and seems to have been influenced by it. Three kinds of figurines were created as icons. They depict female figures, and are named after the Greek letters Phi, C, and Tau, as they resemble these letters. Phi figurines have a round torso, like the letter. C figurines look like arms outstretched over their heads. Tau figurines simply have their arms extended to the sides. The figurines began to appear by the late Helladic period, and their appearances in shrines, graves, and homes, suggest they are indeed representations of goddesses. Mycenaean goddesses were much more represented as warriors, than the goddesses of the Minoans. A plaque from the late Helladic period, shows a goddess in front of an altar, as she holds a large shield resembling the number 8, and a sword in her other hand. Two other figures stand on either side of her. Could this be another piece of who would later become Athena? 
Further past the Mediterranean world, we find the land between two rivers. The Mesopotamians had gods of their own, and have been studied through their steely, cylinder seals, monuments, and written sources, from the two major Bronze Age Mesopotamian languages, Sumerian and the later Akkadian. In Mesopotamia, the gods were represented as living in the city-states they ruled, so politics and religion were always tied together. In Sumerian, they used the cuneiform sign Dingir, and in Akkadian, Ilu, to mean either god or divine being. Mesopotamians had at least 2,000 different gods, depicted with very human features and traits, like eating or drinking excessively, and behaving immorally. The first and foremost god in the Mesopotamian pantheon was Anu, or originally An in Sumerian. He was the divine personification of the sky, and king of all other gods. His parents were the primordial Anshar and Kishar. Anu granted Mesopotamian rulers kingship, but was a being so far removed, that he wasn't worshipped in the daily life of the average Mesopotamian. By the 3rd millennium BCE, Enlil, one of Anu's sons, became seen more as the head of the Mesopotamian pantheon. This authority can be witnessed in the famous epic of Gilgamesh, the tale of Anzu, an epic of Atrahasis, where Enlil is the one who designates kingship. Enlil is seen as controlling the weather, including devastating winds. His earthly domicile and cult center was at Nippur, which was the religious center in Mesopotamia by this time. The cunning and crafty Ea, or Enki in Sumerian, was the third of the so-called triad of sky gods. Enki helped humanity survive the Great Flood, and organized in detail every aspect of the civilized world. Shamash, or Utu in Sumerian, was the Mesopotamian sun god, and responsible for justice, truth, and morality. Ishtar, originally worshipped as Inanna by the Sumerians, was the patron goddess of Uruk. She was the goddess of love, prostitution, and sexuality, and the Sumerians had more myths about her than any other god. Her husband was Jumuzid the shepherd, and her marriage is re-enacted by human kings in the sacred marriage rite. Though she is often portrayed as sexual, this doesn't stop her from being a warrior as well, often quite violent. These deities, along with Ninhursag, a vegetation and fertility goddess, and Nana, god of the moon, formed the seven major Mesopotamian deities. The first three are the primary sky deities, while Inanna, Utu, and Nana, form Venus, the sun, and the moon. These seven were some of the most powerful beings, all directly connected to An. They were the seven gods who decree. They were, the Anunnaki. Ishtar's most famous myth is Ishtar's descent to the underworld, and tells of her attempt to conquer the dark cavernous realm. This world, was ruled by Ishtar's older sister, Ereshkigal. Her husband was Nurgal, a deity associated with war, disease, and death. Ninurta, was originally an agricultural deity and patron god of farmers. Once war became more common, he turned into more of a warrior, and became a champion of the gods against the Anzu bird who stole the Tablet of Destinies. Because of his warrior-like nature, he later became widely worshipped by the Neo-Assyrians. Once the first Babylonian Empire took form, Hammurabi lifted up a minor god, to the top of the pantheon. This was Marduk, and his story, along with the story of the creation of the world, was found in the tale of the Enuma Elish. He became the equivalent of Enlil, who was regarded as the head of the pantheon. In northern Mesopotamia, the Assyrians also elevated one of their own gods, Asher, to the head of their pantheon, as the equivalent of Enlil and Marduk. Asher was the personification of the Assyrian capital city, and was thought to travel into battles with his armies. By the Iron Age, the Neo-Assyrians had brought Asher's dominance to all of Mesopotamia and beyond. On the Indian subcontinent, the Indus Valley civilization emerged around 3300 BCE, and would flourish from 2600 to 1900 during its mature phase. With around over 2000 settlements and numerous urban centers, the Indus Valley civilization was more extensive than both Egypt and Mesopotamia. The gods of the Indus remain a mystery, mostly because the Indus script is still undeciphered. 
scholars have had to instead use seals and sculptures. Because information is sparse, scholars still have debates about the Indus script and about the Indus gods. Many of the sculptures found were from the ancient urban centers of Harappa and Mohenjo-daro. Though many have the signs of fertility goddesses, like larger breasts and hips, it still isn't certain what these figurines were for. So far, over 8,500 have been excavated. Moving on to the seals, the most famous was uncovered in Mohenjo-daro, dated to the mature phase. It is called the Pashupati seal. On it, sits an enigmatic male figure. He sits, with legs crossed, and arms outstretched along his knees. The mystery begins with his face, as he is depicted with at least three faces, or possibly a multi-faced mask. Horns of the water buffalo then rise from his headdress. Around them, are different animals. A water buffalo stands on the bottom left, with similar horns, and as we go around, there is a rhinoceros, an elephant, and a tiger. There are also ibexes or deer, underneath his platform. John Marshall, an English archaeologist who oversaw the excavations at Harappa and Mohenjo-daro, had his own theories about the identity of the strange figure. He identified the figure in the seal as a prototype for the Hindu god Shiva, or Rudra. My reasons for the identification are four. In the first place, the figure has three faces, and that Shiva was portrayed with three, as well as with more usual five faces, there are abundant examples to prove. Secondly, the head is crowned with the horns of a bull, and the trishula are characteristic emblems of Shiva. Thirdly, the figure is in a typical yoga attitude, and Shiva was, and still is, regarded as a Mahayogi, the prince of yogis. Fourthly, he is surrounded by animals, and Shiva is par excellence, the lord of animals, of the wild animals of the jungle, according to the Vedic meaning of the word Parshu, no less than that of domesticated cattle. Not surprisingly, the decades have brought much scrutiny and alternate interpretations. Some claim the figure to be female. Some claim the multiple faces to simply be ears, and that the figure is a buffalo god, or even a buffalo demon. About 130 kilometers, or 81 miles south of Mohenjo-daro, we find another important Indus Valley site. This is Chanhudaro, and it was thought to have a thriving industry for carnelian beads, and manufacturing seals. One of these seals, shows a gore, an Indian bison, standing over a female figure, although she is difficult to notice. Her legs are clearly spread as she awaits the excited bull. As the woman's features resemble plants, some have interpreted this as a meeting of Father Heaven, the Gore, and Mother Earth. There is still so much mystery surrounding the Indus Valley civilization, especially with regards to religion. Was it connected to ancient Dravidian religion, or even the Elamites, beyond the Iranian plateau? Was there a mother goddess cult, or buffalo cult, and were they widespread or localized? Thankfully, excavations are still being conducted, so answers will eventually come to the surface. But with a civilization so enigmatic as the Indus, perhaps we are just digging up more questions. After the Harappan declined, the Vedic Age began on the subcontinent. This was marked by the transition from the Bronze to Iron Age and the composition of the Vedas, along with other important Sanskrit literature. Many of the gods mentioned in the Vedas, written around 1500 to 1200 BCE, are still worshipped today in Hinduism, but there have been multiple changes and evolutions, especially regarding which gods were the most important. The Rig Veda, the first of the canonical Sanskrit texts, begins with a poem to Agni, the god of fire, a very important element for the Homa, a Vedic fire ritual, acting as the mouth of the gods which conveyed the animal offerings to them. He was seen as existing in these ritual fires, as well as in the air as lightning, and in the sky as the sun. Agni is a powerful god, but is mainly associated with the ritual fires. The god who appears most out of any god in the Rig Veda, is Indra. Indra is the god of rain, storms, lightning and thunder, 
and is the equivalent of other Indo-European deities, like Zeus or Thor. He is king of the Devas, the godlike deities, and is most celebrated for his defeat of the evil Vritra, the personification of drought. Indra's victory brought his reigns and prosperity to all mankind. In some regions, Indra is still celebrated each year for bringing the summer monsoons. Soma is another deity associated with ritual. During rituals, a plant stalk called Soma would be pressed, producing a drink. We still haven't identified this plant, but the drink itself had either intoxicating, energizing, or healing properties. During the Vedic period, these three gods seem to be the most important, or the most often invoked. But what of the more familiar gods who would become more prominent in classical Hinduism? Vishnu is briefly mentioned in the Rigveda, but he is designated as a being of supreme importance. The Rigveda describes the Trivikrama, the three steps of Vishnu, which cover the earth, the ether, and the heavens. He is also said to have helped Indra defeat Vritra, residing in one of Indra's thunderbolts. Female deities were not yet as prominent as in the later classical Hindu age, but some, like Vak, were incorporated into rituals. Vak was the personified form of speech, initially the voice of the Brahmana priests during rituals. Her consort was Prajapati, the personification of the mind. In later literature, Vak and Prajapati were associated with the god Saraswati and the creator god, Brahma. Vedic deities often appear in groups, sometimes remaining unnamed. One of these is the Maruts. Sons of Rudra and Prisni, the Maruts are violent and aggressive. They serve as Indra's assistants, and are armed with golden weapons, electrifying lightning bolts. Another group, are the Auditias, deities numbering six to eight, led by Varuna, and described as bright and pure as streams of water. Their number would eventually rise to twelve in later literature, and would come to represent the twelve months. The guardians of the directions, or Lokapala or Dikpala, represent the eight, nine, or ten cardinal points. The four major ones are Kubera, Yama, Indra, and Varuna. Demons are also mentioned in the Vedic texts. More physical than spiritual, they seem to be earthly enemies, called the Dasha. The word could mean enemy or servant, and could refer to a non-Vedic indigenous society living in India. They have also been theorized to either be tribes in Central Asia, or Northern Iran. Some interpret the conflict to be in the spiritual realm and that the dosha could refer to actual demons, some depicted with six eyes and three heads, or even with ninety-nine arms. Another region with a diverse pantheon of divine figures, is China. Chinese gods of the Bronze Age were much different from those of the classical era and later. Most of the more familiar Chinese gods emerged only over the past 2000 plus years. During the first Chinese dynasty, the Shang, Shangdi was regarded as the high god or supreme deity. Shangdi presided over all the lesser gods, like nature gods, and other spirits, like those of divine ancestors. Shang rulers venerated Shangdi, along with serving offerings to the lesser gods and ancestors through official state rituals. The common folk also practiced offerings, but with more personal goals, such as fending off ghosts or demons. Once Buddhism and Taoism came on the scene by the next period, there was a surge in the amount of deities, at the expense of the older Chinese gods. The gods of Shang society were rarely physically depicted, but it seems clear that some more prominent later gods derive from these older ones. The major problem in assessing ancient Chinese deities is that many of the early Chinese writers depicted myth as history. Though some is easy to identify as myth, because of the use of supernatural creatures or events, these figures could possibly have been real, like sage kings or legendary culture heroes. The first of these culture heroes, according to ancient Chinese writers, came even before the Xia dynasty, predating the Chinese Bronze Age in a time of the three sovereigns and five emperors. These three sovereigns were demigods, and the first culture heroes. Though there is disagreement between historians on who these three were, the most prominent were Fu Shi, Shenong, and Huangdi. 
These three were thought to have initiated the cultural progression of the Chinese civilization that would later coalesce. Fu Shi, with his famous serpent tail, was the earliest of the sovereigns, known for taming animals, inventing divination trigrams, and giving humanity advancements in hunting and fishing. Along with his sister, Nuwa, who repairs the pillar of heaven, they are the creators of humanity, domestication, and music. Shenong, known as the Divine Farmer, is a god who brings agriculture to humanity, and teaches them about herbal medicines. While some sources list these three as the three sovereigns, others list the last as another figure. Huangdi, or the Yellow Emperor, is sometimes mentioned as the third. He is credited with bringing writing to humanity, along with a slew of other innovations from boats to carts, the lunar calendar, to an early form of football. His reign is dated to the mid-3rd millennium BCE. The later five emperors came from a lineage thought to have begun with the Yellow Emperor. Two of these emperors, Yao and Shun, were raised to be the best examples of the typical sage ruler. Together with Yu the Great, the founder of the Xia dynasty, they are regarded as beacons of morality and the framework from which Chinese culture evolved. The ancient Chinese viewed mountains as sacred, linking the earth to the heavens. This is why they've often been places of pilgrimage, meditation, and the location of monasteries and temples. It's even possible the mountains were viewed as deities themselves. The mountains were the abode of a variety of mystical animals, spirits, and deities. Rituals venerating the gods were also done for a community's ancestors. This is because for the ancient Chinese, ancestors could also become just like gods. Fast forward to China's medieval period, to a small fishing village on Maiju Island, and a young shamanist named Li Mo. After her death in 987, at 27 years old, she was elevated by her family and community as a goddess of the sea, named Matsu, who provided aid to seafarers. Her cult spread over southeast China and Taiwan, and she has been dubbed Holy Heavenly Mother, Heavenly Consort, and many other formal titles. This example is during the medieval era, but there was much overlap between ancient Chinese ancestors and their gods as well, so many of the supernatural deities might have been based on existing rulers or ancestors. During the Shang, the first dynasty after the Xia, sacrifices and divination were regular practices. Bronze works and oracle bones from the Shang era show attempted communication with gods and ancestors. It was such a popular means of divination, there have been hundreds of thousands of oracle bone pieces recording the rituals. The Shang nobles practiced offerings to the ancestors of the Shang kings and their supreme deity Shang Di, the ruler of the realm these ancestors resided. Once the Zhou conquered the Shang, the supreme Shangdi was replaced with Tian, the Zhou's version of a high god. Both Shangdi and Tian could have been based on ancestors that were deified, perhaps even millennia before the Shang or Xia dynasties.